Okay, so uh, I guess we'll start. Uh, so hello, uh, welcome to the M1 Bodie McBoat Face, the joys of flavor planning by popular vote session. Uh, just curious, a show of hands, how many people are here just because of Bodie McBoat Face? <laughs> Yeah, okay, most of you, that's what I thought. <laughs> well, rest assured, we'll be returning to Bodhi uh, later on in the presentation. Uh, so just to get things started, my name is Craig Anderson. Uh, I'm an OpenStack uh, Solutions Architect at Mirantis. Uh, the target audience uh, of the session would be OpenStack providers that are challenged with a wide diversity of workloads uh, and want to specialize their infrastructure as a service offerings for those workloads. Uh, and lastly, the focus of the session uh, will be the use of uh, Nova flavors to facilitate workload segmentation and some of the associated challenges in doing that. Uh, so to get us uh, on the, all on the same page, let, let's just start with a brief overview of Nova flavors. So um, you know, when you ask Nova for a list of flavors, uh, the first thing you get is something like this, you know, print out of flavor names and uh, instant sizing info. Uh, vCPU count, RAM, disk quantities. Uh, so, you know, we've seen a lot of good uh, talks in the past, I think, about how to optimize uh, flavor sizes and, and to do capacity management. Uh, but I think what's more often overlooked, and, and indeed the, the focus of this session, um, is in another dimension of Nova flavors, which is the, uh, the extra specs. Um, so with extra specs, you know, we can schedule VMs to hardware that uh, support specific features uh, and set other parameters that drive the performance profile of our VMs. Um, so it's the extra specs that enable us uh, to achieve some level of workload segmentation and inf infrastructure specialization here. Um, now, one important thing to note uh, is that in OpenStack, you know, flavors are a flat uh, representation uh, of, of the geometry information plus the extra specs. Um, you know, but for the purposes of your planning, we really want to consider these and think about these separately. Um, so therefore, I'm proposing, or I propose an alternative way to uh, think about flavors. Um, now, you know, first of all, I didn't invent this nomenclature. I just basically stole it from Amazon and compiled the information, you know, here from their website into the logical view you see. Um, you know, conceptually, I think we can think of a three-level hierarchy for flavors uh, with the, you know, flavor type at the top, or what I'm calling, you know, flavor type, which are, um, you know, the main areas of specialization, uh, like compute, storage, or whatever you're trying to optimize. Um, you know, designated by the first letter in the flavor name, like M for general purpose or C for compute optimized. Uh, the second uh, flavor series. So for each flavor type that you have, uh, you can define flavor series, which represent the iterations of your compute uh, hardware. So for example, uh, M1 and M2 uh, would represent your first two iterations of your M flavor. Um, you know, and third, uh, the flavor geometry, so then you can go and uh, basically just generate a set of sizing parameters for each flavor series. Um, so let's let's take a look at these in a little more detail. Um, so f first, we have at the top again the flavor type. Um, but before we look at how you know exactly how to specialize our cloud, I want to address a more fundamental question of should you specialize your cloud? Um, so you know, this is a uh, private cloud, um, and you know we can build everything to our customers' exact specifications, right? If uh, everyone, if someone wants a very specific combination of features, or wants uh, you know highly specific, you know vanilla ice cream flavor with fudge-covered, uh, you know waffle cone pieces and caramel swirl, okay, you know we have them covered, right? Um, you know you could probably do that but you'll also probably live to regret it. Um, you know, private cloud makes it almost uh, deceptively easy uh, to specialize, and, and what I mean by that is it's not as simple as just creating a new flavor in Nova. Um, there, there are other costs you have to be aware of. So uh, to give you an idea about some of those costs, you know, this is just a breakdown of a, a few different scenarios. Um, 
you know, the first scenario is if we're setting extra specs uh, that enable a feature for individual VMs, and those you know features don't impact how we deploy our computes or how we manage our capacity. Uh, you know, something like the watchdog action uh, for VMs is pretty straightforward. Um, the second scenario uh, are extra specs like the libvert options uh, and CPU allocation ratio. Um, you know, th th these are still an easy way to, conf or they're still easy to configure, uh, and they don't require any uh, s real special changes to the way we build our compute host. Uh, but they do mean that we're probably going to have to manage multiple resource pools um, now. So, in other words, we're going to have to create host aggregates, put, divide our compute nodes between host aggregates. Um, and we have to do capacity planning on these, like, subdivisions within our cloud. Um, so the third item here, you know, your costs, costs can start to go up when you talk about things like CPU pinning and huge pages, um, because now not only do you have to manage multiple resource pools, but also each of these are going to be built differently. Um, you know, your deployment automation now has to account for multiple versions of, you know, nova.conf and kernel boot parameters, uh, you know, these... Uh, you know, those configurations will have to be incorporated into your CI-CD pipelines and tested and validated. Uh, and, and lastly, uh, you know, new hardware is another uh, potentially very costly area. You know, new hardware could mean uh, new and unproven uh, device drivers. Uh, moving to a new kernel or operating system, uh, you know, custom builds for, uh, kernel builds for driver backports, different CPU architectures. Um, is really no end, <laughs> in fact. I mean, you know, it could also mean the, um, you know, different out-of-band management tools if you're switching to a different, like di from Dell to HP, for example, or uh, additional testing and certification, uh, or even just the cost of acquiring new, new hardware in all of your labs that you, you know, need, need for development and testing. So, um, so you, can, you can create a lot of extra work for yourself if you're not, you know, careful here with your hardware. Um, and, you know, after facing up to these costs, I, I think the understandable overreaction from some cloud providers is simply to offer no options. Uh, so, you know, the famous quote from Henry, Henry Ford about this was, uh, or about the Model T, you know, you, you can get it in any color as long as it's black. Um, you know, in principle, this is uh, as true today, I think, uh, as it was then, which is that it's always going to be cheaper to produce uh, a large volume of something uh, if they are all the same. So, um, you know, options are costly. Uh, and this is just as true in cloud as it is anywhere else. Uh, so something we should keep in mind. But that said, if you're dealing with a wide range of customers and applications, you're likely going to have a large diversity of cloud workloads. And so invariably, you'll have disappointed customers like these. You know, this, this guy one, wants one that runs on electric. And you know, maybe that's a deal breaker for him, or maybe it's not. Uh, this one wants one that flies. OK, the Model T doesn't do that. So we lose their business. Uh, and this guy, he just wanted a pimped out ride, actually. So, uh, okay, so OK, so what do we do then? Um, as a result. So the answer, of course, is something in the middle. Uh, you know, we need a balance between the two extremes, you know, having only one option versus uncontrolled proliferation of options. Uh, so you want to aim for as few options as possible. Um, you know, the cost of adding support for additional infrastructure variations should be evaluated and justified prior to their implementation. Um, you know, and, and you need to be prepared to, to pay the cost of op, uh, offering those options. Um, you know, to build at scale, it um, requires investment in robust assembly lines. You know, in practice, this means uh, you know making proper uh, investments in your automation, uh, testing, CI/CDs. So. Um, so all right, you know, flavor specialization can be a good thing in moderate, uh, moderation. So let's look at some flavor type examples uh, now at this point. So uh, here, see so here we have a, a price per, you know, price per compute optimized flavor, a price per gigabyte of RAM 
storage, IOPS, uh, storage density, graphics processing. I, again, I actually basically just copied these from Amazon to show here as, as an example. Uh, but I think they're also a fairly reasonable generic set of flavors uh, for private cloud as well. Um, that said, your tenant application requirement should be the driving uh, force behind uh, which flavors you implement. And uh, so something you should be tracking on an ongoing basis. You know, don't, don't fall into the trap of uh, trying to create one flavor that optimizes for everything. Uh, you know, to optimize for everything is to optimize for nothing. Um, so, yeah, that's something to keep in mind there. Um, you know, th there will always be trade-offs uh, like, you know, performance versus power efficiency, quantity versus quality, and that, those kinds of things. Um, so, uh, you know, this is a point at which things can go wrong uh, because the floodgates are open. You know, we're creating new flavors, but, you know, what invariably happens is tenants will come and request, request you know, a specific combination of things. I want feature X and Y, not Z, and I want, you know, a lower overcommit ratio for my workloads, right? Um, and it's these specific combinations that are the real killer because there's really no limit to the number of <laughs> combinations you can have. That number grows very large very quickly. Um, and the reason this is happening is that uh, these tenant applications, in many cases, cases are not cloud native. Um, so they can't easily take advantage of a generic flavor set um, that you might offer them. Uh, so, so what are we going to do about that? Um, well, I think a great starting point is to uh, uh, you know invest in your tenant onboarding. You know, this is kind of a key phase where you know you you can open a dialogue with tenants to get on the same page. Um, it's also a place where you can negotiate compromises, and you know this is a key point here that I think that bears repetition. Yeah, ne negotiation and, and compromise. Um, you know, th this is politics, <laughs> uh, as much as we might not like that. Um, as a private cloud provider, this is just, this is a fact of life. Um, and it's something you should factor into your costs. You know, on the flip side, I think there are also opportunities here to grow these skill sets in your uh, organization and market that exp expertise to your customers. You know, for example, analysis of their applications, their workloads and recommendations um, and that, that type of thing. Um, you know, even if, or, or the, with the transition to cloud for their workloads, even if it's not to your cloud, um, I think there's still opportunities there. Uh, and, and probably the hardest thing here is, is learning, you know, when to say no or to turn down customers who are not a good fit for cloud. Um, you know, it's about the willingness uh, and capability of these customers to uh, compromise and make changes and to buy into a future that might require them to rewrite their applications. Um, it's also about your own willingness to negotiate and compromise. Uh, for example, you know, that could mean supporting a new OpenStack uh, service in your cloud, like Ironic, to provide a bare metal provisioning uh, for apps that are not ready for virtualization and other stepping stones like that. Um, but anyways, this uh, talk of politics and the compromise reminds me of uh, another story, a story which you may be familiar with. Um, so, and that's the story of the ship. And last year, uh, the, the British government, uh, they were looking for a new name for their state-of-the-art polar research vessel. Uh, and some student of democracy thought it would be great, a great idea to put it up for a vote on the internet. Uh, and of course, um, you know, I have here to show you the, the top 20 entries of this, uh, for this uh, prestigious research vessel. And uh, I'll just highlight a few favorites here. Uh, at number 20, you know, Bodosaurus Rex. Um, big metal floaty thingy thing. What iceberg? <laughs> At 12. I like big boats and I cannot lie. My personal favorite, Usain Boat. <laughs> and uh, the number one winner, uh, number, uh, Bodie McBoatface. <laughs> 
winning in a landslide. So, in the end, uh, they turned their back on democracy <laughs> and went <laughs> with what was only the fifth most popular option. Um, so the ship's name, official name will be the Royal Research Ship, Sir David Attenborough. How many of you know who he is? <laughs> oh, most of you, very good. So, um, but the Bodhi name, actually, uh, they, in a tribute to Bodhi, they uh, actually named one of the submersibles uh, after that. So, um, so the name will live on and, and long live uh, Bodhi McBoface. Um, so, you know, I think there's a relevant lesson here uh, or two with the, in the Bodhi saga, which is that, uh, you know, as a cloud provider, you need, to have a, you need to have a strong vision of where your platform is headed. Uh, you know, if you don't tell your tenants how to do things, then they're going to try to take the helm, you know, and, um, you know, to get what they want. And uh, what they want's not always good for them or for, uh, you know, everybody else on the boat for that matter. Um, so, you know, you need to steer the ship as it were uh, while accounting for not just the needs of, you know, tenants, but also operations and other platform stakeholders. Uh, that are essential to the success of your platform. So again, this is more dialogue, negotiation, compromise, politics, uh, and that kind of thing. Um, a lot of that. Uh, so at the end of the day, you know, it's really up to you to provide your tenants what they what they need above what they want. Uh, you know, otherwise you can become a rubber stamp committee like the Electoral College, and we all know how that turned out. Um, so okay, so moving onto the flavor series in life cycle management. So in this example, uh, I've taken uh, one of our flavor types, the C flavor type, which is a, you know, compute optimized, shown you know, just kind of three example iterations of this flavor over time, C1, C2, C3. Uh, you know, one of the things you'll notice is that at this level, we get into the specifics about supported features and uh, configuration settings. You know, as we move from left to right, we can see, um, you know, the progression of changes in hardware configuration and, uh, you know, supported features. And I think this is a good way of tracking and managing, you know, changes to your infrastructure over time, um, how you define, you know, from the point of view of your tenants, uh, your users. So, um, you know, and how you define the flavor iteration is really is up to you. Um, you know, you might decide to evolve your or iterate your flavor. Um, series when you get new hardware, uh, when you decide to add some new set of features, or even, you know, change the way that you're, you build your servers. Um, you know, for example, in our second iteration, we have a node with no local disk. Uh, we use remote cinder storage for VMs, and maybe in a subsequent iteration, like the third one shown here, you know, we have nodes um, with a converged, you know, compute approach uh, that are using local disk again for work tenant workloads. Um, so, you know, one one common problem when putting together your your flavor series is when you have a mismatch of hardware. Uh, so maybe it's inherited. You know, maybe you inherited that hardware from somebody else. Uh, maybe it came from eBay, or the dumpster you know, wherever you happen to find it. Um, you know, whatever the case, right, there's still very real cost to supporting all these hardware variations, even if we don't intend to, to have uh, our tenants distinguish between them. So the first, the first thing you want to do is to take a full inventory of your hardware, um, you know, determine which you can support. Device drivers are usually kind of the, the number one factor for this. It's not uncommon to you know, run across networks car network cards that are unsupported in Linux, or you know, more commonly, um, there will be drivers, but you know, poorly tested with lots of bugs or reliability issues. I'm sure none of you have ever encountered that. Um, you know, so, so similarly, for any new hardware purchases, you, know, you, should, you should be asking yourself, you know, you know, do I want to be the first person running new hardware in a production environment that, you know, requires upgrading to a bleeding edge kernel? <laughs> uh, you know, pro probably not. Um, so, okay, now, you know, purge out the low-hanging fruit, uh, the stuff that's not worth bothering with, right? 
um, and, and you might still have um, a few different server variations that are left, which are pretty similar in, in uh, specification. Um, you know, if they're close enough for your purposes, uh, you know, you might decide to merge them into the same flavor series, even though the hardware might be slightly different. Um, one of the other interesting uh, tie-ins with your flavors is, is the life cycle management side of things, uh, or life cycle management of your hardware as it applies to your flavors. Um, and the, you know, the interesting questions around here are, you know, what, what do you do when you need to grow capacity of your cloud and you can no longer buy the hardware you're already using? Um, in, you know, in effect, the planned obsolescence problem. Uh, you know, you may up, end up supporting more hardware variations than you wanted to. Um, you know, and that raises the question of whether you want to create a new flavor series for this hardware or add it to an existing flavor series. And a new flavor might make sense if you can monetize a difference in hardware performance profiles or you have a new, you know, capabilities to exploit with the new hardware. Uh, alternatively, you know, incorporating new cap uh, capacity with the pre-existing flavor, you know, makes capacity management easier. Um, there'll be less resource islands to manage, and it's kind of the more cloudy approach to things. Um, so, also when you, when you you have server hardware that goes end of life, um, you know, it's kind of a similar situation. You're you're kind of forced you're forced to buy new hardware. It's not the same as the old stuff. Um, so what do you do? Do you, uh, you know, the same, same set of questions as before. But also there's, you know, an operational impact here to assess as well. Um, you know, how, how will your workloads get moved from the end of life hardware to your new hardware? Uh, you know, tenant self-migration becomes a possibility if we iterate our flavor series for the new hardware. You know, whereas if we don't, and the new hardware I just put into the existing flavor pool, then you know, tenants don't have a way to distinguish between the hardware and then, then you'll be the one doing the migrations for them on the back end. Uh, so, so lastly, as with any you know, life cycle management, it's important to document your process. You know, I, I realize you probably can't see the flow chart here. Um, you know, this is really just to illustrate the importance of you know, formalizing uh, the areas that we talked about previously into a concrete process. And I view this as, as you know, one of the key artifacts. It, it can prevent the sort of uncontrolled uh, flavor proliferation seen in, in many private clouds. Uh, so now getting down to our leaf nodes here, the, the flavor geometries and the related advice for, for them. Um, the first piece of advice is actually not to get too, too hung up over them. Um, I, they're comparatively easier to change later on, which you, know, you can do in response to tenant feedback and util, utilization data. Uh, you know, adding a new flavor series is a good opportunity to, to redefine the sizing parameters. Um, for example, geometries, you could change between an M1 and M2 flavor series. Um, the second thing to realize is that you'll face uh, you know, a similar challenge here as with, uh, with the, your legacy apps, as with your flavor features, which is that uh, you, know, you have the people who come in and they want a very sp specific, you know, it needs to be not, no, it can't be 16 gigs of RAM, it has to be 15 and a half, you know, um, right? And, and then again, you know, you have to, you're in a, in a position where you have to put your foot down to pre prevent rampant flavor proliferation. Um, so, you know, for uh, naming your geometries, uh, there's really no perfect system here. Uh, you know, some people have tried uh, using uh, naming schemes that are perfectly consistent and extensible, which means like encoding the geometry information directly into the flavor name, something like, you know, M1.C2M4D50. <laughs> Uh, you know, others go with the more conventional, but like limited logical naming scheme, which, you know, with some kind of qualitative, uh, you know, sizing adjective like M1 small or M1 large. Uh, you know, the problem then is, okay, what in that case is what to do when you exceed large or extra large, you know, do you add more X's like T-shirt sizes or, 
you know, do you, have, you know, add uh, some numeric multiplier? So uh, let's see. And the other thing is, um, you know, we did mention in the previous slide that, uh, that you know, tenants will sometimes have their own specific, you know, oddball sizing requirements. And, uh, you know, it's, it's certainly, uh, uh, you can use private flavors actually to help with that. And then that's, you know, certainly preferable, I think, to polluting your public pool. <laughs> Uh, you know, with all these different uh, variations. Uh, just, just something to keep in mind there, though, is that uh, the flavor names are global scope. So even um, if, you know, both tenant A and tenant B have private flavors uh, that they can't see each other, they, they still have to have separate names. Um, you can still have name collisions. Uh, so, It's just some other considerations um, when you know planning your flavors here. So it, it's a good idea to have a place to document uh, the flavors for your tenants. Uh, an example would be something like the matrix we looked at previously, or something along the lines of the web page you see from you know public cloud providers that describe their uh, flavors to customers. You know this would be the the document that outlines the different flavor types, what they're designed for. Uh, the supported flavor series, flavor geometries, associated hardware info, and the regions where each flavor are available. You know, tenants aren't going to be able to get this level of insight from, you know, Horizon or with a Nova flavor list, so it's kind of important to address this in its own right. Um, another interesting situation to consider is a multi-cloud experience. So if you have multiple cloud deployments or multiple regions, you know, how do you manage the definition of flavors between them? Uh, it's not uncommon for different clouds to have different hardware. Uh, we might have an 8V CPU flavor in cloud one that we called M1 Bodhi McBoatface, right? Um, and maybe we have a different 8 CPU flavor in another cloud, but we called it the same thing. Um, but it's backed by different hardware, right? And, and then, you know, then some people will say, well, this is fine. I, I have a unique set of users in each cloud and they don't know about each other. And so this, this is okay. But, you know, it's kind of a dangerous assumption, right? Uh, invariably, as tenants transform their apps and to take advantage of multiple regions, it's, you know, it, it's just a dangerous assumption to make. So it's just safer to assume that, you know, you'll have some use, user overlap between the clouds. Uh, and that just to use a consistent naming scheme, even if it's not in the, uh, the clouds aren't interoperable, you know, today, as it were. Um, you know, you could also have the situation where the same hardware from cloud two makes its way into cloud one, and then, then what do you call that? You know, M1 Bodhi McBoatface Jr. Or, or what? So, um, so now, just to look at a couple ways you can manage uh, those flavors across clouds. Uh, so, I, th I mean, one effective way is uh, with heat templates. Um, the you know, OS Nova flavor resource type allows you to define your flavor parameters within the heat template. Um, and, you know, then it's just a matter of deploying the heat template to all of your clouds or regions. Um, and you know, taking advantage of the heat automation there. Um, and uh, just one other note is that uh, it wasn't until the, the Newton release that you could actually specify the flavor name in the heat template. Uh, prior to that, you would get a randomly generated name. So just, just something to be aware of if you're on an older release. Uh, one, one other tool is uh, Kingbird uh, from the OPNV community. Um, and the, the aim there is uh, to support uh, resource synchronization between clouds and regions. So things like flavors, images, SSH key pairs. Um, so this may be another option in the future um, when that's ready. I'm not sure exactly when they plan to have that all working by. So uh, host aggregates, uh, this is another important thing to consider with your flavors uh, is the association with host aggregates because host aggregates can be a pain to deal with. Uh, there are additional overhead to manage. It's, it's, it, you know, in my opinion, it's best to avoid using them where it's possible. 
um, I think the more ideal way is to rely on like intrinsic hypervisor properties than to create your own abstractions in the form of host aggregates. So, um, you know, the, the compute capabilities filter is a good example of this. So you can specify in your flavor metadata uh, parameters uh, to target, uh, you know, a CPU architecture that the VM should be scheduled to, a specific CPU model or specific CPU topology. Um, you know, some here like the hypervisor type are also honored when used as image metadata. You, you can use various uh, comparator, uh, comparison operators, uh, like in the case of the hypervisor host name. It's kind of nice. You can uh, schedule to a hypervisor host name that matches a certain regular expression. Um, and also note that in the Pike release, uh, the um, resource provider traits, uh, I believe, are available. And they uh, are related to the placement API that was introduced in Newton for Nova. And uh, they should permit the management of other custom, customized uh, capabilities. Uh, so, so that about wraps things up. I want to thank everyone for uh, attending and who voted for the talk. Uh, happy to take any questions at this point. Please use the mic if you have a question. Uh, yeah. Do you have oh. any hints on, oh, sorry. Uh, oh. uh, on uh, flavor depro uh, deprecating flavors? How should you deprecate flavors? Should you just remove them and the old VMs continue working, or should you just migrate all the workload away and then deprecate them more? Right, so that, that, that's a good question, um, you know, and and I think the the, the real key is you you, you want to give yourself the flexibility in terms of um, you know what you do in those situations because, like, if you look at some of the public cloud uh, providers, for example, they like Amazon has an M3 and an M4 flavor, I think, series, and those have been around for years now. So you might, um, you might very well decide to run, really run it until, let's say, the hardware is end of life. Um, that might be a reality in some cases. Or there might be other business decisions that drive things like maybe the power efficiency of the old hardware isn't worth running anymore. Um, so really, it's, um, you know, th there, there's going to be these other events, other drivers that may, uh, you know, prompt you to do that. But, uh, but if you've kind of versioned or iterated your flavors in a way that you can e easily manage them, then, um, then when that happens, it's, it's easier to uh, implement and to then migrate you know, those users or those VMs off of the old hardware onto new hardware, whether, it's, whether you're doing it behind the scenes or whether you're facilitating your uh, customers or your users doing that themselves. Hi. Uh, have you seen any um, success or failure in aligning uh, the flavor geometries with the physical hardware, in particular from a constant ratio standpoint? So, when, sorry, when you say constant ratio, you're, you're thinking, what are you thinking? Consistent doubling of storage, CPU, and memory, for example. So at the same ratio that the physical oh. host provides. Yes, so you're talking about like the uh, fitting, like, you know, so if I want to divide my CPU by, yeah. Um, yeah, I think this is, I mean, this is a, an air, a challenging area. Um, you know, especially again, you know, in the sort of cloudy approach of things where if you say, well, you know, my users should know about the hardware they're using, right? That's kind of the cloud principle. So if I have all this, uh, hardware in the back end that has different types of CPUs, have different number of CPU cores, different amounts of storage, then um, you know, how can I have one set of geometries that you know, work well for all of that hardware? And then the answer is, well, you, you, you can't. Um, so it, it's kind of one of those uh, decision points or trade-offs in, in there, which is that um, you know, do you want to expose those details, more of those details to your consumer, or to your tenants, and say, all right, you have more options and have more geometries that fit better with a different hardware, but now there's more options, right, uh, that the tenant ha ha has to, uh, you know, before them. So I, I think um, it, it is a difficult, again, it's kind of a balanced thing, and it is, uh, I think, a difficult thing to to manage and get the Goldilocks, you know, the middle four.
Any other qu questions? All right, well, if not, thank you all.